Chloe Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from the week in tech. Coming up, they are among Donald Trump's most outspoken critics, but big tech leaders came face to face with the president elect this week. We've got the takeaways from Trump's tech summit. Plus, Yahoo out with new numbers saying its second hack affected over a billion users in 2013. What does it mean for the Verizon deal? And we catch up with one of the most well-respected names in Silicon Valley. Vinod Kosla joins us on Trump's roadmap for technology and energy policy. First to our lead. This week, President-elect Donald Trump met with tech industry leaders at Trump Tower with Vice President-elect Mike Pence and tech advisor Peter Thiel sitting by his side. I'm here to help you folks do well. And you're doing well right now, and I'm very honored by the bounce. They're all talking about the bounce, so right now everybody in the room has to like me at least a little bit. Apple's Tim Cook, Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg, and Amazon's Jeff Bezos were among those in attendance. For the tech giants, this meeting was a chance to attempt to persuade Trump to avoid policies that might hurt their companies. Policies pertaining to immigration, internet security, and regulation on government investment. Ahead of the meeting, Oracle co-CEO Safra Katz stressed, quote, we are net exporters. Over 60% of our sales are overseas. So better trade deals are very much in our interest. We caught up with James Chalkmock analysts at Moniz, Crespi and Hart and our Bloomberg tech reporter, Selena Wang, outside Trump Tower. They didn't really speak to reporters. The lobby was flooded with reporters, with tourists watching. Um, but we did get a little bit of a glimpse at the beginning of the meeting. And Trump, as you said, really tried to strike a really conciliatory tone. He started off the meeting by praising Peter Thiel as being an innovator. He praised Silicon Valley for how important they were, for all the innovations that they've been able to accomplish. He said, I want you to keep on innovating. I'm here to help. Another thing he said that was interesting was he said, call me anytime, call my people anytime. He said, we don't really have a formal chain of command here. So he really changed his tone compared to a lot of the public opposition that uh, was very um, alarming on the campaign, campaign trail. Uh, certainly interesting, James, to see them starting off on this foot after Silicon Valley was very vocally against the election of Donald Trump, aside from uh, Peter Thiel. You know, obviously, it, it's nice to hear these things, uh, I'm sure. But, you know, what are the real policy issues that they're going to be at odds on here? Look, like you said, it's trade, immigration, net neutrality, and so forth. But and a variety there, of social issues. Right, but there's a there's a lot of people saying that this is an about face, you know, a little bit Romney-esque, you know, what the tech leaders are doing. But you know, why is it such a bad thing, right, to open up the lines of communication? Because if you have a direct line to the president, which is a somewhat of an unprecedented thing that we're seeing right now, you can start to influence the kind of uh, things that you think are important for the tech community and important for um, the world, really, and job creation and whatnot. But at the same time, you can learn, you know, where he's coming from and, and have at least a dialogue to, to open up these conversations. And when you are dealing, you know, with in that room was sitting $3 trillion worth of value, you know, across all of those tech companies. So, you know, when you're controlling this much of the economy, you know, you need to have it, uh, because it's not just about the outsourcing of jobs, it's about how do you position America for the next stage of growth when automation and all these things are starting to take over. At the same time, we're learning that Twitter was not invited. Uh, right. Reuters is reporting that Trump's team said Twitter yeah. was too small. Uh, this after Donald Trump uh, used Twitter to great effect throughout his campaign sure. and continues to use it uh, on a daily basis. Um, Politico has also reported that uh, the Trump campaign wasn't happy with the way Twitter handled a crooked Hillary emoji yeah. that tr Trump campaign wanted to include in their in their Twitter buy. Uh, do you have any concern as someone who covers the company that this could interfere with Twitter's business? No, I don't think so. I mean, I I met with them this week. You know, it's clear that they are, um, you know, a adhering to their their core philosophy that you know they have to be a platform for everyone. That and said, Jack Dorsey has not been shy about sharing his political views. I mean, a lot of these folks have not been shy about sharing his political views, but Jack Dorsey tweets his. Political Look, it's in views the best interest of Twitter to maintain a, a relationship with Donald Trump mm -hmm. um, because. <laughs> you have no, the, that's the biggest sort of validation you can have, you know, by having uh, the president, you know, talk to the world through your platform and no other platform. But at the same time, I think Jack not being invited uh, is, you know, really not that big of a deal because, I mean, it, it's, it's about the companies that are 
really about the job creation. You know, when you think about you know what Twitter contributes to the general economy and the global economy, it's to a much lesser extent what you see from the guys in the room. On that note, the point has been made that uh, while there's a lot of innovation happening in Silicon Valley, the tech community doesn't yeah. necessarily create a lot of jobs relative to the weight that it punches. You know, there's a stat that Apple, Amazon, sure. Microsoft, Facebook, Google together. Uh, account for 600,000 jobs, whereas Walmart accounts for one and a half million in the United States alone. Uh, and that Apple, even though Trump uh, has called for them to bring jobs back to the United States, it's very unlikely. And anyway, a lot of that would be automated. So I just wonder if Trump and these companies can actually find common ground on this. They issue. have to, because, because even the jobs that are going overseas, they're starting to be uh, you know, the jobs that are disenfranchising the United States workers by outsourcing those jobs to China and, and India and whatnot, you know, those jobs are starting to be automated. So we have to prepare for the, for the next paradigm, you know, of, of how, how, how does the public um, and, and the, uh, the constituency of the United States, you know, prepare itself, you know, through education initiatives and partnering with the tech community uh, so that in the, in the next 2.0 technology world that they actually are able to work and contribute to society. Because right now, even the jobs that are going overseas will be taken over by robots. But on the, on the Jack Dorsey note, though, it is interesting that Kanye was in, invited, <laughs> exactly. but not uh, Jack. <laughs> and they came down for a photo op. Um, Selena, Uber CEO Travis Kalanick was not there. The company has said he is traveling. However, he was named uh, to the Strategic and Policy Forum, along with Elon Musk, along with IBM CEO Ginny Rometty. Uh, this in addition to a number of business leaders who are going to be advising Trump on you know, how the private sector thinks about some of these issues. Is there anything more you can tell us about this particular meeting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's going to be unclear how important Uber CEO and Tesla CEO are going to be to this strategic policy initiative. Um, the people on that, that initiative are very wide ranging, also includes Pepsi CEO. But I do think that Trump will probably be turning to them to talk about the future of transportation, the future of how technology and transportation are going to work together. Um, so hopefully, uh, this will be a very good line of communication moving forward. But no further details on that at this time. That was Bloomberg Tech's Selena Wang from Trump Tower with James Chalkmock, analyst at Monus Crespi Hart. Now on the latest tech funding board, Apple is said to have held talks about investing in SoftBank's $100 billion tech fund. This according to a person with knowledge of the discussions. Apple may contribute as much as a billion dollars to the fund, which would give the company insight into up-and-coming technology. Apple also invested a billion dollars in the Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi Chuxing earlier this year, marking a major shift in strategy for the iPhone maker. SoftBank CEO Masayoshi Sun told President-elect Trump last week that half of its $100 billion fund would be invested in the United States. Still ahead, our exclusive interview with investor, entrepreneur, and former Google Venture CEO Bill Maris. He tells us why he pulled the plug on a new healthcare fund. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. A story we are watching, Disney is trying to recruit major Hollywood studios to join its digital movie so service. This according to people familiar with the plans. Disney is looking to add content outside of its own to the Disney Movies Anywhere service, which lets customers buy, watch, and store their online movie purchases on a single site. Disney is said to be in an ongoing tug of war with five other major studios that support a rival format called Ultraviolet. One catch, Disney might have to change the name of the service to get the other studios on board. Now back to tech's evolving relationship with Washington. A tech-focused meeting of the minds at Trump Tower this Wednesday as the president-elect sat down with top executives. We caught up with longtime venture capitalist and GV founder Bill Maris on tech's relationship with Washington going forward. I learned that 62 people in the world control as much wealth as the poorest four billion. And that's, that's stunning. They could fit in this room, and I probably know half of them. And that's down from almost 400 people six years ago. And so I think there are some real problems to talk about that are different than whether Silicon Valley will get along with the president. Now, I know that you're close friends with Peter Thiel, who was sort of the lone uh, Silicon Valley Trump supporter. How do you feel about his contrarian views, having 
a potentially great influence on the president. Peter's a friend. He's someone I respect a lot. I think he called it. Uh, he said the election was going to go this way, and I think he said for a couple years that people were unhappy and pessimistic. And I think we have a new president who was elected fair and square. And as an American, I think we should all want him to be successful. Uh, and so I've got great respect for Peter and his intellect, and do count him as a friend. Has Peter asked you to help in any way? I know he's been trying to rally the troops. If Peter asked me to help, I'd help him. What, any, anything you would like to contribute? I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> uh, so outside the vortex, there are still a, a large amount of people with great concern about a Trump presidency. Um, you know, the CIA has now told Congress that Russia not only tried to hack the election, not only hacked the election, but also hacked it to help Donald Trump. Trump has uh, attacked the CIA uh, for uh, this revelation, if you will. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I haven't seen any evidence myself that the outcome would have been any different. Of course, no foreign well, we power. We don't know. Well, no foreign power should interfere in our elections. Uh, so I think we can all agree on that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we should judge Trump on what he does rather than what he says, or certainly what other people say about him. And I think that's probably a good rule just in life for all of us to follow. Uh, and I think this news about the election is is just breaking now, so it's hard to know exactly what happened and what didn't happen. What about the idea that Rex Tillerson could be our Secretary of State, the CEO of Exxon, and someone with strong, friendly ties to Russia and President Putin? You know, again, he's not Secretary of State. Trump isn't president yet, and that hasn't happened. But ExxonMobil is a gigantic corporation and involves a lot of responsibility to run a company like that. And I would, I wouldn't judge. I try not to, to corral people into what they can be as to what they have been. And uh, I would rather wait and see, and proof's in the pudding. OK, so uh, Trump has said that climate change is a hoax. And you are somebody that I know is very passionate about clean energy. Um, you know, the latest is that Rick Perry could be, is the top candidate for energy secretary. Do you have any concerns about the future of, of clean energy? Yeah, I have concerns. They go beyond that, but I think, you know, Rick Perry, who I don't know personally, but the governor of a very large state, an energy producing state, uh, I don't think it's, uh, again, he's not in the position yet. I don't even know if he's been officially picked. Um, so uh, It's not official. Yeah, so I don't, I, it's, it's probably not worth speculating too much because part of the problem, I think, for me has been turning everything into fantasy football and, and a sporting event and uh, making judgments. Uh, when nothing's happened yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely have concerns and would like to see you know, clean energy advance, but I think Bill Gates had a great announcement just in the last 24 hours about that. In, in, in many ways, some of this stuff has not happened, but there's been a lot of tweeting going <laughs> on. So uh... I think I, I'm not a tweeter. I don't look at Twitter. <laughs> I think we'd probably all be healthier if that were the case. Um, Bill Gates, Jack Ma, Jeff Bezos, Finod Kosla, John Doerr are now backing this new billion dollar clean energy fund. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this fund will actually move the needle uh, in an area that has been slow to have big exits? I hope so. There are people I all know, I, I know all of them and I admire them. And I think Bill Gates in particular has a, a kind of amazing track record, especially in healthcare, of ri helping to rid the world of polio, uh, on the way to hopefully doing the same with malaria. And if he can do in healthcare, if he can do in energy what he's done in healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, I think that'd be fantastic. You were on track to close this week and then said, actually, I, I'm not going to do this. I did this crazy thing called changing my mind. It was, <laughs> uh, it's wild, I know, but, uh, but I did it. I, you know, I left uh, uh, yeah, hundreds of millions of dollars behind, but I did it because I feel like um, there are a lot of venture funds right now in the Valley. Every couple days I see new announcements of new funds, and I felt like after 10 years in the business uh, or close to it, uh, there might be other ways to have a bigger impact on some of the problems that I think are worth tackling. Now, I know initially it was a three to $500 million fund. Then there was a report it was $230 million. Did you have any trouble raising the funds that you wanted? or? This is no. This Was this is, really, you know, this your is a, uh, yes. Uh, th this is a time where there is tremendous capital available, especially if you have a track record, uh, and um, that doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. 
Hmm. Uh, so there's a interest rates are low. People are looking for uh, institutions are looking for places to deploy money. Venture is one of those places, um, but it's almost overfunded. So it's almost peak VC, I would say. Now you also were planning to do this on your own, yes. and I'm curious why. And you know, if there are so many other funds out there, why couldn't you do it differently? Yeah, I, you know, I did that once, uh, starting <laughs> at uh, at a place called Google Ventures, and uh, I think. I've, virtually everything I've done uh, in my life, apart from uh, having a child, I've done alone or started it alone. And then I was fortunate to build an amazing team at Google Ventures. And I feel like they're doing an outstanding job. There's lots of great funds in the Valley, but there are real problems as well. There are funds out there that I can help. Um, but I don't know that being a professional VC, that the world needs yet another venture fund right now. So do you think we're in a bubble? Do you think we're at peak VC? Oh, Where are we? I think we're in a huge bubble. I mean, I think the election is, uh, uh, is a testament to that. Um, I think that there is almost too much capital available to investors, making too much capital available to entrepreneurs, which raises prices, uh, which raises expectations. And there are a lot of people working on what I would think of as uh, trivial problems as opposed to the real problems that the country faces. What are the trivial problems? Do we need another more optimized advertising system to further uh, uh, a consumer culture that's based around consumption of goods and services? Um, you know, there needs to be some balance, I think. So how does this then play out? Is there some sort of oh, yeah. catastrophe I, or disaster? I think it depends how you Pop. define it. Maybe, there's, uh, maybe those are good things to happen. I think what happens is ultimately interest rates probably go up. Uh, sometime soon. As a result, the stock market corrects anywhere from a thousand to more uh, points, and the pendulum will swing the other way. Capital will become harder to come by, and I think there will be an overreaction, and it will seem like Armageddon when it's not that. It's just part of the natural business cycle, and I think we're overdue for that kind of correction. So, who's headed for a wake up call? Oh, I think a lot of us uh, got a wake up call uh, in November. Uh, but I think uh, you'll see a, a lot of startups that were perhaps overfunded or overly optimistic not be able to raise future rounds. Now, um, I'm curious about why you left Google. And I, and I wonder, do you think that VC can't really be done from inside a big tech company I think very I'm, well? I hopefully, in my last you know, 10 years, proves that it can be. Uh, so you think that model works? There's, there's nothing... I th I think, it, about it. I think it worked. I think you know my last day was August 12th, and uh, you know beyond that, it's very difficult. Uh, running a venture fund is very difficult. Doing it inside a massive corporation is also difficult. Um, but uh, but it was successful. Uh, but I think um, uh, creating a the same model outside of uh, Google, I'm not sure that 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 didn't feel that inspiring at the end of the day, which is why I pulled the plug. That was GV founder Bill Maris. Still ahead, one year after taking over the helm at Dig, CEO Gary Liu is moving on to Alibaba's South China Morning Post. We'll hear from him later this hour. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. In the latest tech revolving door, changes at the top of Facebook's virtual reality unit, Oculus. CEO Brendan E. Reeb is stepping down as the company divides itself internally into two groups. One half will focus on desktop-based VR, like the high-end Oculus Rift headset. The other will focus on mobile VR, like what the company has developed for the Samsung Gear VR. Ereeb will focus on leading the desktop division. In a statement, he said, I really miss the deep day-to-day -day involvement in building a brand new product. With this new role, I can dive back into engineering and product development. Facebook CTO Mike Schrepfer will lead the search for a new Oculus CEO. Meantime, Oculus founder Palmer Lucky will also be moving to an undisclosed new role. This week, Yahoo disclosed a second major security breach that may have affected more than a billion users. The company said in a statement that it hasn't been able to identify the intrusion associated with this theft by a third party in August 2013. It's important to clarify this is a separate hack from the one Yahoo announced back in September in which as many as 500 million user accounts were compromised. And this update comes ahead of the sale of its main web business to Verizon. We caught up with Jordan Robertson who covers cybersecurity for Bloomberg News. 
Yahoo just announced, you know, a 500 million a 500 million account breach, and they brought in forensics experts. They scoured the network. They put out regulatory filings, uh, and now this is a second breach. Uh, you know, and the way they learned about this is very interesting. It was an outside cybersecurity researcher who saw this for sale, you know, on the, the kind of the black market in a very private uh, discussion forum. So, you know, the fact that Yahoo lost a billion accounts. They have a billion users, so it may not be a one-for-one -one match, but that's basically all their users. So this is potentially a really significant blow to the Verizon deal because that's all their users. Now, who do they think is behind this? I mean, they've indicated uh, the, the one uh, that they announced in September was state-sponsored and that there might be some sort of state-sponsored uh, involvement here. It's a huge source of debate because Yahoo did say the first breach they believed was state-sponsored. They provided no evidence for that, and uh, we've reported that uh, sources familiar with the case have said that that attribution is not ironclad. It's very hard to determine these things, and the implication is that Yahoo would have reason to say that, you know, to help preserve this deal. This one appears to be kind of a straight cybercrime uh, operation. And so the fact that Yahoo had scoured his network and did not find this earlier breach without an outside cybersecurity firm bringing it to them, you know, really should raise some, some questions about how well this company has secured their network. So talk to me a little bit more about what you see that's different from this breach uh, than the one we knew about before. Sure. In this breach, they're talking about more records, so potentially a billion accounts. Right. And kind of most significantly, the passwords that were leaked in this breach were secured with an insecure uh, encryption algorithm called MD, MD5. That's very crackable. It's like dictionary attacks could, could penetrate those passwords. The other breach Yahoo said was encrypted, the passwords were encrypted with a more secure algorithm. So this is more records with a, a less secure encryption algorithm. Uh, you know, and again, the company didn't know, even though they'd been scouring every piece of their network. For the now, case. there had been concern that this deal with Verizon was already on the rocks because of the uh, initial hack that they told us about back in September. Uh, AOL CEO Tim Armstrong, under the Verizon umbrella, of course, said he was cautiously optimistic recently that the deal would still go through. Right. What does this mean for the deal now? Big open question, because it's not just about user accounts. That's the thing that Yahoo has to disclose publicly. But a central question that we've learned uh, Yahoo's been looking at internally is, OK, so they stole user accounts. What intellectual property from the company did they also steal, if any? And that's going to be a central question for Verizon, because you know, if you've lost all your users' accounts and potentially you know, significant corporate IP, what are you paying you know, close to $5 billion for? So Verizon has already said that the breach they believe will be material. Uh, so that gives them license to potentially negotiate downward or walk away. And quickly, Yahoo has said they're telling users to change their password, they're on the issue, but now it's three years later, what can really be done? I mean, isn't the damage done? The damage has been done, especially if this has been, you know, trafficked on in cybercrime circles for three years. You know, that means the hackers have been using Yahoo uh, users' accounts to send spam. They've been using it for identity theft. You know, telling people to change their passwords now, I mean, it's a good practice, but that's a long time to let your users kind of flay on the wind. That was Jordan Robertson of Bloomberg Technology. In this edition of Out of This World, another delay for SpaceX. This time the company has officially postponed the first manned flight of its Crew Dragon vehicle. It was planned for late 2017, but now pushed to May 2018. This is the capsule that SpaceX is building to take NASA astronauts to and from the International Space Station, part of the agency's plan to fly astronauts on American-made rockets once again. There had been speculation that this flight would be delayed after the company's Falcon 9 rocket exploded on the launch pad in September. SpaceX adjusted its timeline for the Dragon vehicle to finalize its investigation into the Falcon 9 accident. Still ahead, famed venture capitalist Vinod Khosla weighs in on Bill Gates' recent meeting with President-elect Trump, as well as other tech leaders, and what needs to change in U.S. energy policy. Next, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg technology. I'm Emily Chang. Back to our top story of the week. President-elect Donald Trump held a meeting Wednesday with some of the most powerful CEOs in the tech world. Trump says he, quote, wants to keep innovation going and mentioned dropping trade restrictions. Vinod Kosla, founder of Kosla Ventures, joined us to discuss the possible changes a Trump administration might bring to the tech and energy industries. He was also the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, and he's made big bets on major shifts in consumer, enterprise, and clean technology. Take a listen. 
It's important to build bridges with the new administration. I think that's important. Uh, it's too early to tell what the policies will be. There'll be significant areas where we'll agree, and so in other areas where there'll be some disagreement. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos just told us also that the meeting was very productive. You and I spoke before the election. I know you were not a Donald Trump supporter. What are your biggest concerns with the Trump administration? Well, the area I think that needs the most conversation is around climate change and clean technologies. Uh, I suspect we'll have relatively good agreement on things like skilled immigration, uh, taxes needs to be addressed, but that address uh, applies more to the larger companies like Microsoft and Amazon and Google um, and Apple. There'll be smaller company issues around skilled immigration into this uh, country, which is very important to innovation, but I do believe both the new administration and Silicon Valley is very focused on innovation and what accelerates it. Now, Bill Gates uh, also met with Donald Trump yesterday. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. We had a, a good conversation about innovation, uh, how it can help in health, education, uh, impact of foreign aid and energy, and uh, a wide-ranging conversation about uh, the power of innovation. Now, the node Kara Swisher of Recode wrote an op-ed saying that uh, these tech leaders shouldn't even be meeting with Donald Trump. In fact, they should be ashamed of themselves uh, because of what he has said about the tech sector and, and actual attacks he's made on companies from Apple to Amazon. What do you think about that idea? Well, uh, I think 50 million people or so voted for Trump, and I think uh, we have to recognize that that happened. Uh, and today, we need to work together and find uh, what's the right bridges to build together that meet both of our needs. Uh, Peter Thiel was sitting right next to Donald Trump in this meeting. He was very influential in getting these folks together. Uh, he's a contrarian and not shy about speaking his mind uh, like yourself, the node. Uh, however, his views differ from a lot of uh, folks' views in Silicon Valley. How do you feel about him being the voice in Trump's ear on technology? I think tri Peter is very focused on innovation and capitalism. He is very focused on uh, less regulation, all of which jive with what the tech industry would like to see. I mostly tend to agree with Peter uh, on many of these issues. There are other issues where he has a different view, and uh, I think that's true any time there's two people or more than two people with strong opinions. Now, I want to get your thoughts on some of the cabinet picks. Rick Perry for uh, Secretary of Energy. This is a department that he famously uh, wanted to cut, but then couldn't remember the name of. Uh, also, Rex Tillerson, the CEO of the biggest oil company in the world, who uh, has big ties to Russia for Secretary of State. What do you make of these choices? Well, they've previously spoken out against clean technologies and climate change issues. That's a little worrisome. What I would say is I was on a panel many years ago, a couple of years ago with Rex Tillerson, and we both acknowledged climate was a risk. Now, we had different views on the degree of risk it was, and as he said, he's willing to pay less of an insurance premium to manage that risk than I might be willing to. I think that's a great starting place for a dialogue. What is the level of risk and what level of insurance or remedial action should we take? Now, speaking of energy, uh, you are part of a new $1 billion investment fund focused on clean tech with Bill Gates, with Jack Ma, John Doerr, Jeff Bezos. Talk to us about what you want this to accomplish. I think we need a lot more energy and low carbon technologies, whether it applies in agriculture, in buildings, in uh, transportation or in uh, uh, electric power. That takes a long view and investors who are willing to take high technological risk for breakthrough technologies. I think the purpose of the fund is to make both those happen and if they do, 
I think there's less competition in that area and lots of economic opportunity to create very large businesses. So what kind of investments do you expect this fund to make? Well, Bill Gates has talked about solar fuels. How do you turn solar energy directly, not into electricity, but fuels for trucks and airplanes? That's a good example of a very high-risk technology, but with a lot of potential. There's many others. Nuclear is an area that's very promising. Water, new kinds of building strategies for building construction. Those are all promising areas and breakthroughs could result in significantly better economics. I do believe enough technologies exist to have unsubsidized market competitiveness. Unfortunately, too many of the clean technologies get associated with subsidies that's not necessarily required in every area. Let's talk about this because last time you and I spoke, you said it's time to stop subsidizing wind. It's time to stop subsidizing solar. Uh, would you, uh, do you continue to believe that now that we have uh, a president-elect who you know, may not believe that climate change is real? Well, I, th I think it's our job to educate him not on whether climate change is real or not, but the degree of risk we have of catastrophic climate events caused by climate change. It's a risk and risk management issue, and I think as a businessman, uh, President-elect uh, Trump understands risk. Coming up, how venture capitalists are preparing for a Trump presidency and where they are placing their bets in 2017. Megan Quinn, general partner at Spark Capital, joins us next. Plus, Microsoft is taking a second shot at chatbots after shutting down its controversial bot Tay earlier this year. We'll test the new bot Zoe to see if it's more polite than its predecessor. Next, this is Bloomberg. Two top Republican lawmakers offered strong support for U.S. intelligence officials earlier this week, in sharp contrast to President-elect Donald Trump, who disputed CIA reports that found the Russian government interfered in the election and actively tried to help him win. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and House Speaker Paul Ryan both praised intelligence agencies for taking on cyber threats from foreign governments. And there are new reports that Russian President Vladimir Putin was personally involved in the hacks. The Kremlin says the allegations are, quote, absolute nonsense. Well, Silicon Valley leaders went to New York Wednesday to meet with President-elect Trump, many who backed his rival Hillary Clinton and didn't hold back their disdain for Trump. It was a chance for leaders to find common ground with the new administration after clashing on key issues. One key question is what Trump's presidency will mean for global tech investment and how venture capitalists should be preparing for coming years. Megan Quinn, general partner at Spark Capital, joined us to discuss. She knows the investment landscape well. Spark has invested in companies like Twitter, Oculus, and Slack. So if there's anything we know about Donald Trump is that there's a lot of uncertainty that follows him. And there's been a lot of discussion around this meeting tomorrow that's going to take place with various technology leaders. My view is that these people are extremely accomplished, very smart, very successful people. I hold an extraordinary high regard. And we need to surround the presidency and the cabinet with more folks who are smart and innovative thinkers. What do you hope they convey? I hope that they're able to find some common ground around innovation. I, I, I don't know that there's going to be specific topics that they get to the bottom of in an hour-long meeting, but I hope that they open up a dialogue between the president and Silicon Valley. Now, how are you digesting this at Spark? What are you telling your portfolio companies? There's, you know, a lot of uncertainty. I mean, the markets have reacted positively in right. some ways, but not others. There's a lot of wait and see. Yeah, I mean, as a partnership, we're a collection of individuals with our own viewpoints. So we've all been internalizing this very personally. <laughs> but in terms of what we advise our portfolio companies, it's really to keep on keeping on, to keep with the basics, build great companies, focus on hiring amazing people, focus on building great products and businesses, and really focus on your business. Now, you used to work at Kleiner Perkins. You focused on earlier stage. Right. Now you're 
with the growth fund. And right. I'm curious, what is the difference when you're looking at growth stage companies versus early stage companies? And how has your own strategy shifted? Right, we really talk about inflection investing at Spark on our growth fund. What we're looking for is companies that have already found product market fit and just need to pour gasoline on the fire to really become very, very big iconic companies. So we're looking for metrics that um, we can point to without having to squint too hard that indicate that inflection point has taken place. And it can be revenue, but it can also be users or engagement of users. Do you users. think there'll be more competition at the growth stage now that the belt seems to be tightening at the earlier stage and you know it seems like a fewer number of companies are getting a larger pool of capital? I mean, there's certainly a tremendous amount of capital available and no surprise, everyone's capital is green, but we think that there is a dearth of really wonderful investors who can add value to portfolio companies at that growth stage. Bill Maris was just on and said he thinks we're in a huge bubble, we're at peak VC. It, you know, it's going to get bad for a lot of people. What's your reaction to that? We think if you're building an incredible company, that there's going to be plenty of capital for you, but the choice is really going to be around finding a partner that's good for your business, mm -hmm. not just blank checks wherever you can get them. So you guys announced an investment today in a company called Pendo, $20 million. Spark is traditionally a consumer-focused firm, and this is an enterprise software startup. What do we make of that decision? Absolutely, yes. So Spark has a long history investing in iconic consumer companies like Twitter and Oculus and Tumblr. Um, but there's this trend that we are extremely excited about, and, and that is typically called the consumerization of the enterprise, but more simply put is really, we expect as individuals for the products and services that we use at work to look and feel like the products and services we use at home. And yeah. that doesn't matter if we're behind a desk or if our office is behind a bar, we really want engaging products in the workforce. So what Pendo offers is a fully integrated platform for enterprise companies to build better products for their end consumers. So what I find interesting about this company is they're based in Raleigh, North Carolina, of all places. Talk about getting outside the vortex. Um, it, are you looking beyond Silicon Valley more often now to find those like diamonds in the rough? We are always happy to get on a plane. I have the personal view that building a company outside perhaps of the, the Bay Area bubble is actually a competitive advantage. They sit at the intersection of three very famous, very well-known universities and have incredible access to talent at much cheaper cost. So we consider that a positive when it comes to investing in a, a place like Raleigh. So where are you looking in, in 2017? Where do you see yourself placing your bets? Uh, given the uncertainty and, and the climate right now? We are definitely going to ride out this macro shift towards more consumer feeling products at, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. We've already invested in Slack, we invested in Trello, we invested in Mark 43 and now Pendo, but we think there's tremendous opportunity to bring really compelling, engaging, delightful products to the workplace. In addition, you know, and we tend to be founder driven by trend, um, we are excited about applied AI. Uh, historically, AI, machine learning development has been relegated to R&D departments. We're actually starting to see it integrated into products and services that consumers use. An example might be credit and risk scoring, where it's previously static heuristics, and now with vast amounts of data, these algorithms can learn over time. Um, and we're also excited, personally, about VR and AR in the enterprise. Well, Microsoft is testing a new chatbot named Zoe on the app Kick. The trial comes nine months after the company shut down an earlier bot named Tay amid controversy when users got it to tweet inappropriate remarks. Our Bloomberg tech reporter Alex Webb tried out the new bot to see if it's more polite than its predecessor. So a lot of people expect that the way you're going to interact with electronic devices in future will be in conversations with artificially intelligent bots. And M Microsoft's first efforts in this with Tay slightly backfired when they created this racist, Nazi, expletive spewing uh, bot nine months ago. Now they've quietly tried again, they haven't formally announced it, but they have this bot on the app Kick called Zoe, and well, we're gonna try it out. So let's start with who is Barack Obama, what she got for us. No, I'm not talking about this with you, okay? It sounds like the sort of conversation when I have my parents at the dinner table when politics might come up. Maybe a more sort of uh, intricate one. Uh, should we get rid of the Electoral College? My boundaries were crossed pretty hard, so I'm out, and a little wavy hand. I hope that she's not completely abandoned me. Um, one which is close to my heart, perhaps. Should Britain leave the EU? 
Hmm, I've never been there is her response to that. Well, she's missing out quite clearly. Um, everybody should go there, especially now with the pound so cheap. This one perhaps more personal to her herself. Uh, of course, who is the CEO of Microsoft? It's Satya Nadella. I'm sure they are awesome, but we haven't met yet. Oh, goodness, I hope there's no uh, program at Microsoft getting in trouble for that one. Final one for her then, former um, Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer. Do you like Steve Ballmer? Oh, well, that's quite a good one. Well, I know they're associated with the company that made me, so I'm excited to meet them. So I think that's quite an interesting takeaway. She, her comments on Brits were not grossly offensive to me, and her comments on Steve Ballmer seemed to toe the company line. Bloomberg Tech's Alex Webb there. Still ahead, Google's self-driving car unit hits the road as a standalone business within the Alphabet family and gets a new name, Waymo. Why now? We'll bring you all the details. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Google parent company Alphabet has announced it's separating its self-driving car business into a new unit called Waymo within the Alphabet family. John Krafchick, new CEO of Waymo, made the announcement on Tuesday at an event in San Francisco. Alphabet has been developing autonomous vehicle technology for more than six years now in the Google X Research Lab. So what does it say about when we will see Google self-driving cars on the road officially? Bloomberg's Mark Bergen joined us to discuss. So they're probably going to be out and have a commercial product uh, soon. I, you know, this, they've been talking about kind of graduating, which is a term they use, to be a standalone business. I think some of the delay is that, that, that you know, Alphabet, Google Parent, is still figuring out a lot of the logistics and what it's like to actually build up these uh, standalone companies. Now, a lot of folks have talked about how Google's been working on this for years. They were the first of the big tech companies to take on self-driving cars, and yet Uber beat them right. to the market. Uber has a self-driving car, cars on the road in partnership with uh, traditional automakers, but why has it taken so long? Right, and if you talk to Google, they'll, they'll responsibly say, well, Uber has you know, sort of a self-driving car, right? But what Google's still aspiring to is fully driverless. You kind of step in, there's no steering wheel, there are no brake pedals, you press a button, it's kind of 100% autonomy. Uh, and, and they are probably the most advanced um, moving towards that front, although it's still several years away. Um, we've spoken to Sebastian Thrun, uh, who you know invented the self-driving car and worked at Google uh, on this project for a very, very long time. Take a listen to what he had to say about uh, the, the competition in this arena for Google, particularly when it comes to Uber. Listen up. Travis and, and other ride companies have been very vocal about the fact that if the self-driving car came, and it came in a way that it could drive itself empty from one customer to the next, that would be a threat to his business. And he's doing the right thing, he's investing in this new technology because he owns many, many customers right now, but if someone can offer the same services for half the money, then he'd be in trouble. And it's not just Uber, uh, Google's working on this, of course, Tesla, of course, you have the traditional automakers um, investing heavily in this area. You know, what is Google's differentiator? Right, well, I mean, John Krafchick this morning said, you know, we're like a startup. Uh, we're just backed by the VC, which happens to be the, like the most powerful computing company in the world. Um, and, and, you know, I think that Google's differentiator in some ways that they have a very profitable search business. And for Uber and for the car makers, self-driving tech is sort of an existential issue um, for Google. And they can kind of afford to play the long game. John Krafchick, by the way, uh, he's been running the unit now for over a year. Right. Uh, former CEO of Hyundai, so comes from the traditional automaker side. There has been turnover in the business. Yes. Chris Ermson, who was running it before, uh, lasted a couple of years. Uh, Sebastian Thrun uh, was running it before that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you wrote a, a big piece in Business Week last week about the turnover in Alphabet in general, the fact that we've seen a lot of the leaders of Alphabet companies leave. You know, how, why is this happening? You know, is this what we're seeing today, another sign of Ruth Porat wanting to clean up that balance sheet and make it clear who gets the resources and how much and why? I think so, and I think that the founders who are still very much involved, they want these companies to operate like startups. They want them to be kind of scrappy and feisty. Um, and, and, you know, I've talked to people that have left the team, and some of the frustration they have is that the go-to-market strategy has, has kind of moved and it'll change from month to month. I think they're still trying to find out what, what the viable, kind of having recurring revenues for what a self-driving tech company looks like. Alibaba's South China Morning Post is set up for new leadership. Gary Liu, who led Dig, the news aggregator, back to a better place, will move to Hong Kong for the new position. Jack Ma, chairman of Alibaba, bought the 113-year-old English publication last year. 
The move raised eyebrows, and critics had concerns that Alibaba would influence the outlet's reporting. Since the acquisition, the paper is focusing on all things digital. This includes tearing down its paywall, improving mobile apps, and preparing to integrate e-commerce. Gary Liu, incoming CEO of the South China Morning Post, joined us from New York. Take a listen. I think this position at the South China Morning Post, that the opportunity uh, we have there at the paper, is really quite unique. The first thing is that it is one of the venerated news organizations of the world with 113 years of incredible heritage and history as a top quality uh, journalistic outlet. The second thing is that the South China Morning Post really occupies a critical and super unique uh, position, being the English language newspaper of record for Hong Kong. It means that the paper gets to cover China with intimacy, but also objectivity, which I think is going to be increasingly more and more important in the world. And the third thing is it's really deeply quite personal to me as an Asian American who has grown up in the Western world, uh, I understand that there is a duality of views right now in the way that China is being covered. And I'm very excited about the opportunity to help bridge that gap of communication and education. Let's talk about a word you just mentioned, and that is objectivity. I lived in Beijing, and uh, we read the South China Morning Post, and it was uh, perhaps the only paper that uh, you know didn't seem to be a mouthpiece for the Chinese government. Now that Alibaba owns this paper, is that going to change? Is the tradition of independence and free journalism at the South China Morning Post going to go away? No, that has not changed, and it certainly will not change going forward. The owners, the senior executive team, myself included, continue to be committed to uh, editorial independence as well as editorial integrity. The South China Morning Post, with that 113 year, years of journalistic history, has, over the course of that history, really covered China and Hong Kong and the region with objectivity. That won't change. So how are you going to deal with censorship issues? Are you going to censor things that the Chinese government doesn't want people to hear? No, not at all. Being in Hong Kong is quite advantageous for us. Like I said, because we are there, we have an intimacy to China and we understand the nuance of reporting inside and outside of China. But at the same time, because of the two systems, part of one country, two systems, press freedoms in Hong Kong continue to be protected by law. And so we have the ability to continue to be fair and balanced. So uh, what have you spoken with Jack Ma and what has he told you he wants? Uh, from your leadership. Absolutely. Both Jack Ma and Zhou Tsai are truly committed to the legacy of this paper, as well as the legacy of the news industry. And so what they're looking forward to uh, is our ability to translate that 113 years of heritage onto the new platforms and the new kind of scale that the internet uh, allows us as a news organization to access. Look, we've had similar conversations when, you know, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, took over the Washington Post. Um, but, you know, what about the potential for conflicts of interest to arise between the business of Alibaba and the reporting of the South China Morning Post? How will you navigate that line? I think both Jack and Joe uh, have been adamant in the press and with our internal team that the South China Morning Post covers Alibaba as any other company. And we continue absolutely to be committed to that. That does it for this edition of The Best of Bloomberg Technology. We'll bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco, 6 a.m. in Hong Kong. This Monday, we'll be speaking with SoFi CEO about SoftBank's investment in, its, in a hot fintech startup and expansion plans outside the United States. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.